we're going to do two parables, um, parable of the mustard seed and the parable of uh, the leaven. Uh, they're pretty short parables, uh, three verses in all. So we've already seen uh, two of the public parables, the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat among the tares. So we've got the mustard seed and the leaven today. As a reminder from the sower, we saw that the gospel will be preached through the world, but will not cause a universal conversion. It'll have a diminishing return. And we saw with the tares among the wheat that the heirs of the kingdom will grow up among false heirs or tares. Uh, the apparent heirs of the kingdom will contain bundles of false believers at the end of the age. And today we'll look at the mustard seed, which is the coming of the kingdom will be preceded by a monstrosity, which hosts the workers of the evil one in its branches. And the leaven, that corruption will enter the wheat, corrupting the whole batch. Corruption will enter the message of the kingdom, corrupting it completely. Now this is the message of scripture, but not necessarily the message of the church. Uh, I guess that can be kind of controversial to say. But uh, it's kind of human nature to look at our own situation and saying that we're doing everything perfectly and everyone else has failed. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the situation of Israel at the end of their age as well, uh, with the Pharisees thinking that they had held on to the true faith and Christ returned to tell them that actually they had missed the heart of the issue. Uh, so we'll see the institution of the church uh, as quite different from what's called the secret church or the universal church, um, that the makeup of the church corporately is not necessarily the makeup of the church spiritually. Uh, so let's take a look at that. A little reminder of the um, process in interpreting parables. We have to note the story's natural meaning, uh, the difference between a parable and an allegory is that a parable is a true to life story. It's a situation that's not um, abstract. You're not gonna have talking animals and things like that. It's a very realistic story. Uh, within that story's context, we have to determine the problem, the question, the situation that prompted the parable. Uh, so in other words, why did Jesus start to tell this parable? What was the question or what was the situation he was speaking to? We have to ascertain the main truth that's being illustrated by the parable, um, understanding that each parable um, is aiming a dart at a specific problem. And although there are many peripheral uh, elements of that parable, there's always going to be one core truth to that parable that it's trying to say. And that's why we have eight parables here, because he's got eight different angles he's, he's showing us on um, this one time period. He's not attempting to give us one big parable that incorporates the whole of what he's trying to say. Each one is going to aim at a specific truth. Uh, we have to validate those uh, main truths of the parable with direct teaching from scripture. And uh, we have to note the actual or intended response of the hearers. And we'll do that after we've uh, looked at all four. That's how we'll open up next time is looking at these four together, uh, the first four, which are the public parables, and how did the disciples react after hearing these? Uh, we don't get any information about the rest of the audience, but the disciples, uh, it's pretty uh, poignant how they react to these parables. As well, uh, let's note the uh, setup of these parables, what had just happened um, in the context just prior to these parables was the initial rejection of the kingdom. Uh, so throughout the gospels, in fact, throughout the entire Old Testament, a kingdom that was earthly with a human ruler had been promised to national Israel. Christ came offering that kingdom in the gospels and it was rejected by first century Israel. So that rejection had just taken place in Matthew 12 and then Matthew 13, is um, Jesus' response to that rejection. He is now outlining uh, what the future will look like um, 
in the postponement of that kingdom. In other words, it's kind of like one of those books you get at the library when you're a kid, where you get to choose what happens next uh, based on Israel's rejection. Uh, Christ knew his place. Pardon now he's me. able to, oh, that's okay. Now he's able to reveal this uh, mystery um, that had been kept from them up until that point. And that's the mystery of the church. Um, so we're going to uh, look at this from that context that Christ is uh, at this point still in seed form, letting Israel, or the disciples know that the kingdom that had been promised is now postponed. And this is the character of the age while it's in postponement. That's one reason why we're looking at it in juxtaposition to the seven churches of uh, Revelation, because this is the first uh, teaching of Christ on what this age of the church will look like. And Revelation gives us the last um, explanation of that church age. Uh, in fact, in uh, reading about Revelation this week, I came across a quote which ties it directly to these parables. And it's by Arno Gabeline. And it says in the fourth kingdom parable, uh, which is the one of the 11, uh, corresponding to the fourth church period, our Lord speaks of a woman who took leaven or corruption and put it into fine, pure, three measures of meal, symbolically of the doctrine of Christ. The woman in the parable of the leaven is Rome the Jezebel in the message to Thyatira. Uh, so I, I can't say that uh, I agree 100% with what he's presenting here, but he does see a connection uh, between the fourth church, Thyatira, and the fourth parable, uh, which is the parable of the leaven. And um, as I told you when we were starting to look at the churches, I am not of the persuasion that these churches outline a chronological order of church history. Uh, I think uh, looking back at it, you can see church eras, but I don't think that's what scripture is teaching. Um, so we can't be dogmatic about that. But it is interesting to see that there are certain parallels between um, the churches and the kingdom parables. And I think that has more to do with the fact that it's giving the same message, but the kingdom parables are given to Israel uh, to let them know that there is now going to be an, a parenthesis in between their kingdom program. And revelation is directed to the church, um, especially those seven church letters. Uh, so it's basically two sides of the same coin. And that's why we'll see certain parallels between them. Uh, the setting of these first four parables uh, is outside um, to a large crowd. Christ is sitting on a boat um, and he starts to speak in parables for the very first time. It's so shocking to his uh, disciples who have only heard him teaching uh, very clearly up until now. In fact, this comes on the heels of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which is a very clear uh, message. He is very um, explicative about what he's saying. But here, when he starts to speak in parables, it's for the purpose of concealing information from those who do not have ears to hear and revealing information to those who do have ears to hear. Uh, so it, it has that purpose of uh, no longer casting the information out to anyone, but so that Israel doesn't become more responsible for the information that they've rejected is only casting this information onto fertile hearts and fertile ears. So let's take a look at the parable here of the mustard seed. It says, he presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This is the first of these four parables that isn't interpreted directly by Christ. And uh, we'll see in the eighth parable when we get to that, that 
uh, part of the purpose of these parables, especially in close succession, is that their information builds on one another, that if you're not receptive to the information from the first one, you're going to have a paucity of information when you get to the second one and then the third one, so that if you've, um, if you've not been willing to uh, learn from these parables in the first and the second, where they're explained to you explicitly, um, you're not gonna be able to follow along as you go further into these parables. So the information uh, compounds on itself. And this is a very unique set of parables because he didn't give just one parable and then in a different situation, give another parable. But these were just rapid succession parables that he was giving them all as if they were meant to be um, interpreted together. So looking here at the birds of the air, uh, probably less than two minutes before this, he gave us uh, the, what a bird represents in the set of parables, and it represents the workers of the evil one. These birds were the ones that came down and plucked away the message of the kingdom uh, from unfertile hearts. So it would be very strange of Christ to use them in one parable, uh, just moments earlier, to mean something evil, and then in this parable to mean something good. But unfortunately, that's how a lot of uh, commentators have taken it, that somehow this parable is dislocated from the ones just previous to it. And they'll say that this uh, great mustard tree is the growth of the church and that it's going to become huge and uh, protect birds of the air uh, that can nest in its branches and that these are the servants of God. Uh, again, it's very strange if that is Christ's meaning because uh, it doesn't seem to be the plain sense meaning. And uh, there's a good ditty that pastors often say that if the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense, or you'll end up with nonsense. And uh, I think that's one key that we've got to keep here is that we've, we've got to stick with the plain sense. If we depart with it now in the third parable, by the time we get to the eighth parable, it's not going to make any sense. So we've got to interpret these birds the way that Christ has interpreted these birds for us. And that's a something evil. Uh, let's look at some key principles that we can um, take for interpreting these points. All these parables are joined together by the Lord. He presents them all in a set. Um, we can't uh, have one contradicting another. And the parable of the sower predicts no incredible growth of the kingdom gospel. Uh, it has to be something different. So this church is, or this, uh, this parable does have a tree that's growing incredibly fast and incredibly large. Uh, our first parable tells us that that is not what the church looks like. So this has to be something different than the church. Uh, this tree has none of the characteristics of the church. Its roots are firmly planted in the earth, whereas our roots are firmly planted in heaven. Our citizenship is not on earth, but in heaven. Uh, we're not here to plant ourselves deep here. Uh, and this is a monstrosity, not a picture of miraculous growth, but of abnormal growth. Uh, it says in this parable that this is the largest of the herbs. Uh, herbs are not trees. So it's interesting that he correlates this with an herb which is a small leafy growth that doesn't have any hard wood structure to it. So this is an abnormal uh, picture uh, of plant growth and it would not be very consistent um, to view this abnormal structure as the structure of the church, which is a creation of God. Uh, we also see that it is a shelter for the birds which have already been identified as the workers of the evil one in Matthew 13, four and 19. So we have here in John, uh, Christ telling us what the kingdom is like. And it says, and this is Jesus talking to Pilate and he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is my, but as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Uh, 
So this mustard tree that's planting its roots deep into the earth um, would be contradictory to Christ's own words about his kingdom if this were representative of the church. Uh, we also have a similar picture uh, with Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 5. And Nebuchadnezzar in a dream that's not as common or popular as his uh, dream of the magnificent statue um, is his dream of this gigantic tree. And it says, now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I was looking and behold, there was a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew large and became strong and its height reached to the sky and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth. Its foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches and all living creatures fed themselves from it. Now, again, just like in this parable, it might seem at first glance that this is a good thing, a magnificent and wonderful tree. Uh, but just like the magnificent and wonderful statue that we see just two chapters earlier in Daniel, uh, this is good for the world, but bad for those who are not of the world, uh, which is the church. Uh, so the picture of the statue shows us the different kingdoms that will conquer over Israel that will put them under their foot and uh, rule over them. And this tree that Nebuchadnezzar gets an image of just a few chapters later um, is similar in that way. Nebuchadnezzar has been given something by God that we call the divine right of kings. Um, it's explicitly spoken to him that he now has that right to rule. Um, and he does so in uh, at times ways that are not uh, not uh, okay with God, and at other times he does rule well. Well, this just uh, is just prior to his judgment by God, where he's given the mind of an animal and sent out into the wilderness to wander until he turns his heart towards God. Uh, so this is a picture of his vast and magnificent kingdom of the world. And um, he does have a responsibility from God to rule his subjects well, as they're all part of his creation. But that's not how these kingdoms of the world progress, because only Christ, as the king of the earth, will ever rule justly. Uh, so in other places in scripture, this gigantic tree is not something benevolent, uh, but something which has both its positives and its negatives, but in the end is chopped down. Uh, just later in this section, I think uh, verses 14 and 15, this giant tree is chopped down and the Lord commands that it be cast over with metal so that it can't grow anymore, that the stump um, has no ability to grow. Uh, it's very similar to Nebuchadnezzar's vision of uh, his statue that is broken by a stone uh, that's cut without hands, that his empire on the earth will eventually be completely destroyed and cut off from the earth, and that in its place will be the kingdom of God. So this giant tree, this giant mustard seed, is what is growing up on the earth until the time of the Lord's return, where he will set, set up his church, or his kingdom rather. And that kingdom won't grow like a tree. It'll come in a moment. It'll come in an instant and spread over the whole earth. It's not, um, it's not something that's going to grow into um, its full kingdom. All right. And next we have the leaven. And it says, he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Again, this is another parable that uh, when taken by itself and disjointed from the others is often taken as something positive. Uh, people will say that the gospel is the leaven. And then th this leaven, when it's put into the earth, will convert the whole earth. Uh, but it does a lot of damage to the context as well 
um, even on its own, it doesn't really merit that interpretation. So we got seven interpretive points on this one. Uh, the first three parables speak against world conversion. So this would be contradictory if this one said that the world would be converted. Um, again, these are compounding truths. So uh, if we understand this one as world converting, we also have to be able to view the other three as supporting that. The gospel is not a mystery, um, so it can't be the leaven. These are the kingdom mystery parables. These are told, uh, it's said to us that these are mysteries. Mysteries are things that are not until this point revealed. So this is a new revelation. And the gospel isn't a new revelation. In Galatians, it says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Uh, that was well before this point by about 2,500 years. Uh, so the gospel isn't a new revelation that's taking place uh, here. This leaven is something different. Also, the gospel does not have the same effect as leaven to puff something up. Leaven is purposefully always spoken of as something evil because it inflates, it puffs up, it makes something um, which could have a form of humility into something that is uh, has no substance of its own. Uh, it's a fake or a counterfeit. Uh, the gospel has not had a permeating effect in history. We can't say that the gospel was um, put into the earth by Christ and that it's permeated the entire earth. Uh, by that, you would have to show some example of a nation or a city or even a town that has been completely converted, just like leaven completely uh, changes the flour. Also, leaven is always used as a type of evil. Uh, 13 different times in the New Testament it's used. Each time it's used as an image of evil. So for this one, to be anything but evil uh, would go against basically all principles of interpretation. Uh, leaven just simply is not used as a benevolent picture. Uh, these measures of meal cannot be the unconverted world. Uh, these measures of uh, meal come from the flour that just in the previous parables has been related with the fruit of the gospel of the kingdom. So that fruit now being ground up and prepared as a meal, it would be, again, contradictory to the previous uh, parables to now view this wheat for some reason as the unconverted or the unregenerate heart um, that needs to be converted by the meal. It's already converted. Um, we have to view the meal in this uh, scenario as the uh, good thing and the leaven as the bad thing, meaning that the bad will, will uh, corrupt the good. And uh, finally, the actions of the woman in this parable are contrary to the methods of sharing the gospel prescribed by Christ. Uh, Christ says that the things that he tells them in secret were to go and share with the whole world. Uh, the gospel is not something that we hide in a clay jar. It's something that we, we share abundantly and uh, not in secret. Um, her method of corrupting this entire uh, three pecks of meal is not the way that we share the gospel. Uh, it's not the way that it's prescribed for us to share the gospel. So let's take a look at a couple of verses. Uh, in the Old Testament, we see that leaven is also used as a picture of evil so much so that it is not allowed to be part of the sacrifice to God. It says, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of Passover to be left over until morning. And later in Leviticus, it says that we can't offer it um, as a burnt offering either. No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall not offer up in smoke any leaven or any honey as an offering by fire to the Lord. In the New Testament, we have here in the book of 1 Corinthians uh, that we ought to be putting out the leaven in our lives. So it says, your boasting is not good. 
Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has also uh, been sacrificed. Uh, it also speaks of the Pharisees in the parables as uh, leaven, and uh, definitely not in a good sense. So uh, this leaven, we have to view it as something evil. Otherwise, uh, we've not interpreted this consistently with the rest of scripture. All right, so... Um, I grabbed this from A.W. Pink again. He's got a really good explanation of these parables um, as well. I'd recommend Gabeline or um, Andy Woods on this topic. But uh, Pink summarizes these first four parables in this way. He says, one out of the four, speaking of the first parable, uh, castings of the good seed yield, uh, yields any fruit. In the second, the crop as a whole is spoiled by the mingling of the tares among the wheat. In the third, the little mustard seed develops into a great tree whose branches offer shelter for the agents of Satan. In the fourth, the three measures of meal are ultimately completely corrupted by means of the leaven surreptitiously introduced into them. All right, so that's kind of an abrupt ending. But that's where we are with our four parables, and we've got four left to go. Uh, but those are for another time. So if anyone has any questions, comments, or conversation topics, we are now uh, finished with the message tonight. I'm a little confused. <laughs> All right, go for it. Well, I think you missed the tears. What's that? I think you missed the... Uh, the one where we did the tares and the wheat. Oh, was that? Okay, maybe I need to go back and look at that. But even yeah. like the mustard seed, right? I mean, yeah. he says, I need to find the scripture on it. Um, mm -hmm. But did, can you go back to the one where it talks about the mustard seed? What scripture was that? Uh, that's Matthew 13, 31. Because he says that... Um, kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed and which the man took and sowed into his field all smaller than the other seeds but when it's full grown it's larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so yeah. if heaven is like the mustard seed that grows in its big tree then how is it that it becomes protection of the agents of satan yeah so uh how people have interpreted this one um in a in an attempt to be consistent with the rest of the body of scripture is that this uh, mustard seed is a corrupt church, that the church itself is that, um, that monstrosity that holds the workers of the evil ones. I've seen someone directly relate it to the Catholic church, which hosts in its body um, lots of pedophiles as um, higher ups. And those are the ones that would pick off the innocent, uh, those who have heard the word of gospel, but have been abused by those in the church and might turn them away from accepting that gospel. Um, so it's, it's a, more along the lines of the coming of the church or the coming of the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that uh, this is the time period in between the offer of the kingdom, the rejection, and then the final coming of the kingdom. And that's why we have to look at it like we do with the tares or later when we'll get to the dragnet, where it gives us time period, uh, specifically as that time period that um, intercedes between that offer rejection. And then it says at the end of the age, these will be cut out and the kingdom comes. Um, so that's why it is hard to interpret these one at a time. We've got to look at them in their full context. Okay. So, your can question? You hear me? yeah. So, when I read that scripture, he, he presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. So, I'm looking at the entire scripture and I think 
if you just say the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, period, then that would not make sense. But if you then out of, of church knowledge and, uh, and you are a man who puts it into his own field or, you know, something like that. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Basically, it's kind of the corruption of the kingdom of heaven or what the kingdom of heaven is offering yeah. and what it, what that results in. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's like the mustard seed of, it's like that, you know, the heaven is a, a very small piece of it, but if left to man's own designs, it can be corrupted. Mm -hmm. And that's very similar that's to kind of what, the parable of the leaven. That's kind of what I, yeah. And this is what I'm reading just because it says comma, which a man took. <laughs> and I'm just looking at how, how that whole sentence works together. Yeah. That, 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 hopefully. The, yeah, it is. Um, I, again, as we get deeper into the parables, they're meant to not be as clear um, without the foundation of the previous ones. And you can look at the end of this um, section of parables in the last one called the parable of the householder. It says that um, the householder is the one that brings out the old into the new. Um, so it, it has the idea in the context of reading the New Testament in light of the Old Testament, but also looking at these parables and reading the newer ones in light of the older ones. Um, so it's essentially... The householder starts with his foundation and he builds up. Uh, so that's kind of the interpretive key, which is unfortunately for us placed at the end of this chain of parables. But uh, by that point, uh, just like Christ said after the parable of the sower, this is for those with ears to hear um, and eyes to see, so that he, he interprets the first two for us. And that's the only interpretation we get after that. It's up to us to be faithful to the context of scripture, understanding where he's at, why he's answering these questions and the situation surrounding it. And um, that's why we can't really dislocate these from their context. Otherwise, uh, they don't make as much sense. But that being said, uh, it's always possible uh, that I and or others have misinterpreted these. So it's important that you do go back to scripture yourself and search these out. This is just the best explanation that I can give uh, from what I've studied. So um, I, I would love to hear it if you do have, um, uh, like your question now, uh, further areas where I can study it, but also that you can study it because ultimately we're iron sharpening iron and prophecy isn't of private interpretation. Uh, we're to be sharing it and um, learning from one another. So I might be the one with the um, host setting on Zoom, but it doesn't mean that I'm uh, necessarily even the leader of this group. Uh, so. Uh, oh, no, you're the leader. <laughs> well, you're not the leader, but I think we're all bots. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, maybe. You know, yeah, no, we all, we all have a part to serve in a Bible study where we're all studying together, um, even if it's just encouragement for one another. But it's important as well um, to hold each other accountable for the way we interpret scripture, especially if we're teaching. Um, it says in scripture not to let too many people be teachers because um, <clears throat> there's high responsibility put on teaching that um, even for teachers, we have to be teachable. Um, so uh, definitely, if you have questions like well, that, you I can appreciate it. Yeah, how, hmm? What, Sherry? I have appreciated um, how I've appreciated how you have often have pointed out other people's point of view. You say, and then you say, "This is my point of view," but others, you know, interpret it this way. So several times you've done that, and I've appreciated that. Yeah. yeah well, actually, if uh, if you do want to read someone with a different interpretation of these parables. Uh, John MacArthur um, does disagree with uh, this interpretation that I presented. Um, so his book, uh, The Gospel According to Jesus, he takes a different uh, view on these parables. Um, so if you want to see what another person has to say who doesn't see it this way, um, I'd recommend John MacArthur. 
I think he does a pretty good representation. I, I think his argument falls to pieces very easily, but another person might read them and say that my argument falls very easily and that his makes sense. So um, I, I do think he, he definitely gives a very clear uh, representation of another point of view on these scriptures. Cool, I'll look that up. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. It's Dungeon Night. <laughs>